Shout outs to the good people down at Independent Dope. Like, all right. <clears throat> Lethal McCollum, welcome to Independent Dope Live, man. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here, man. Uh, let's jump right into it. Um, you grew up in Brooklyn. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tell us about that. Growing up in Brooklyn in the uh, 90s, early 2000s, what part of Brooklyn? Uh, Flatbush. Flatbush, Brooklyn, uh, slash Canarsie. Okay. Um, so I lived half of my life in uh, Canarsie, East Flatbush, and then the other half in uh, Flatbush, Flatbush, like the heart of Flatbush. Um, I mean, you know, I grew up in mid '90s, early 2000s. Uh, it was it was different, you know what I'm saying? It was to me like the golden era, like Brooklyn, when Brooklyn was at its finest before gentrification, before all the, you know, we were invaded. You know what I mean? So what they call the old Brooklyn, the old Brooklyn. You know okay. what I mean? So Brooklyn, it was fun, it was lively, it had color to it, it had vibrancy to it. You know, I grew up, you know, at the era of, I, I guess, people finding themselves outside of the crack era, outside of, you know, the 80s, which was like havoc to any yeah. neighborhood, you know. So it was like the 90s where, you know, Hove was at the top of the world with, you know, dropping a record every month. Yeah. And then, you know, I grew up in the projects, Glenwood Projects. So in Glenwood... It was, you know, it was, it was crazy. You know what I mean? Bloods and Crips on each side of the projects. <laughs> one side was blood, one side was Crip. Did you, you fall know? into that? Me? Nah, not necessarily. I mean. What side did you live on? I lived on the blood side. So, uh -huh. with, it wasn't like I fell into it, but it's where you grow up. You know, if you, sometimes you're just guilty by association. You know That's what I mean? Fact. So, I wasn't necessarily you know, jumped in or, you know. You were active, but your friends were. Yeah, yeah, but all them. my friends were, you know, my brothers were, everybody was. So for me, I was just like, I rep just because it's like my neighborhood, but I wasn't affiliated, affiliated. Like okay. I wasn't doing the things they were doing. Right. I feel like we're from the last era of like, we were outside, but we caught the beginning of the internet too. Yeah. Like nowadays yeah. you drive around, nobody's outside. Like how how is Glenwood in 2022? Oh man, I mean, I, I I visit just frequently, but it's still the same, which is funny. You know, it's still the same. I still got a lot of good friends there. You know, family even still live out there, but it's just different. Like you said, we from the era where I remember when MySpace wasn't even a thing, and then we found MySpace, and it's you know, <laughs> Sconex and Facebook. I remember when Facebook was just for college students. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I remember just the transition from like no social media to like the world being nothing about nothing but social media. So fact. like that whole process was just interesting. But like I used to love the fact that you didn't see what everybody was doing. Like if you wasn't in their in their world in their environment, you you had no idea. You just heard from the grapevine. But now it's like everybody in everybody business. So it's a, it's a very different world. Right. And, and you have nine siblings. Not nah, my yeah. My mom had eight kids, and I have a, a stepsister, but she's my sister. Okay. Uh, yeah. So nine. Where nine you siblings. fall in that? I'm right in the middle. So okay. it's three older, and then four younger, four or five younger. Yeah, right in the middle. All right. And your background? You Colombian, and is your mom Panamanian? Yeah, my mom is uh, African American Panamanian. My pops is Colombian. So. Yeah. Your stage name? Where would you come up with that? Julito. Nah, I ain't come up with it. So you know, in the Spanish culture, it's like everybody get a nickname. Like, yeah. it's, and then your nickname is like you grow to it as being your name. And it's funny, like my real name, I didn't really care for it too much because I already looked like a girl growing up. I had long <laughs> hair. You know what I mean? People always mistook me for a girl. So then my real name, kind of. Uh, Back in the day, with in my immature mind, it sounded like a girl name. So once they gave me the nickname Julito, I, it just stuck, and I just used that as my name. So it's break not down. really a stage name; it's just just my name. Oh, break down the real name versus just <laughs> only for you, man. <laughs> <laughs> like break down the my real name. I, I I'm good with it now. It's it's Uriel, but in in the Spanish culture, they pronounce it Uriel. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Uriel is my real name, and then you know Julito is a nickname. I like Uriel now, which is crazy. It means was it an angel of light? Like, That's why I I, I I I've grown to like it, and I'm okay with it now. But growing up, like you know, if you a little kid with hair down your back, 
everybody coming up to my mom's like, is, oh, is this your daughter? Is this? Yeah. I'm like, Uriel just did not work. You know what I mean? Especially back niggas with braids. It was with old, braids? Man. Come on, yeah. man. Like it was, and my hair used to be like super long. Facts. So it was like, it was tough. So nah, I just like Tulito. Yeah. yeah. I, I call you sometimes. I say, Uriel. Yuri. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fine. There's only like three people on this planet that call me Uriel. Any or anything around that name, like, and none of it is family. Okay, it's like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but you grew up single parent household. Yeah, yeah, single parent. My mom's, you know, it was all my brothers and sisters didn't live with me at the same time. Um, so first she had four boys, and then there was a, like a large gap in between okay. her, her daughter, my sister. So it was just four boys at one point. But my oldest brother. At like 15, he moved to Indiana to go to Kentucky to go hustle and like never came back. So he was he really wasn't in the crib. And then my second oldest brother, Carlito, he uh he moved in with his pops early on. So really growing up, it was just me and like two of my siblings okay. for most of my most of my childhood. And your pops came from Columbia. Columbia, yeah. Nova City. Uh Bogota. If okay, I'm not the capital. Yeah, the capital. Yeah, okay. he was the first of his family to come to America. And what happened when he got to Brooklyn? So yeah, so my pops got to Brooklyn um, early, late 80s, um, like 88, 87. Uh, he came out here, so he was working with, you know, a very high prominent drug dealer out in Columbia, and he came here. And Can was, you say who? Uh, I ain't gonna say who, not for here, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But like, he, he was working with a high prominent drug dealer in Columbia, very known drug dealer okay. that many people know. And uh, he came to America to, you know, get that that American dream, you know? And he came to Brooklyn, and maybe within his first month of being in America, in Brooklyn, he met my moms. So it's a funny story, like my moms didn't speak Spanish, he didn't speak American, but they met and like fell in love automatically. Still and made like, it work. Yeah, and when they first met, he bagged her, bagged meaning he he talked to her, you know, in New yeah. York slang. Uh, he bagged to using a translator. That's so fine. yeah, he brought the translator over, like tell her tell her what I'm saying. And um, it's like a crazy story, you know, like and automatically, like once they met, they were like inseparable, like that, they didn't leave each fine. other's side. And uh, yeah, to his demise. That's a it's a movie in itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. a, I know we had that connection because your pops from Colombia came to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. My pops from Venezuela came to Brooklyn. Yep. Your pops passed away. My pops got deported. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. like, and you don't meet that many Colombians. And New York maybe is different, but like. Yeah, that, which is good. crazy. I didn't meet his family until maybe a few years ago, actually. They found me on like Facebook. It's crazy. Yeah, like so really, really quick story. Some dude randomly writes me on Instagram. and He's like, yo, um, is your name Uriel? And I'm like, what? Like, nobody knows me as Uriel, <laughs> especially random people. I mean, you could Google it, but yeah, ain't no yeah, random yeah. hood dude going to know me as Uriel. I'm sure he didn't Google me. So he, when he writes me that, I'm like, where? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, why you ask? He like, yo, funny story. I'm in a barbershop right now, and The Wire came on, TV, on the TV. That's and good. some random dude was like, yo, that's my, that's my nephew, or that's my cousin. And he's like, what? He's like, yeah, that's my cousin. And he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm his father's cousin. And mind you, I have never, I only met one of my father's family members in my whole entire life. One of them used to live in my projects growing up. But yeah, so the dude hit me, he like, yo, if you mind, do you mind this dude wanna get your number? He wanna connect with you. And I'm like, um, okay, like I ain't know, you know what I'm saying? Like anybody can say anything. I ha I've heard it all, so I'm like, okay, sure. And when he, the, you know, the, my cousin hits me up and was like, yeah, we're your father's family. We live out here in Queens. Uh, we'd love to meet you. It's a, it's a few of us out here. Um, and when I met, I, it took years for me to meet them because at first I was a little skeptical. But then when I, I finally decided in 2021, I finally decided, like, I'm going to go to Queens and meet them, man. And uh, it was so weird. It was the first time being in a room with, like 10 people who looked exactly like me. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, I'm looking around like, yo, that looked like a different version of me. This looked like, like only people that look exactly like me are my children. Other yeah, than that, <laughs> like, you know, so it was cool. It was cool to meet them. You know, it's cool to, to see another part of my, me, you know what I mean, essentially. You look just like your father. pops. I look just like split image of my father. Yeah, I seen pic post picture on Instagram. I was like, that's crazy. He had the, split the image. curl, the hair like you got the jaw. Yeah, that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, split image. So 
how'd you get into the industry in general? Like you started dancing? Yeah, yeah. So my mom, you know, hustling from Brooklyn. She grew up in the era where you go get it. You don't, you like, however, by any means. And I just was always a different kid growing up. You know, I just always was a kid that was like, you just looked at him and you knew something was very different. He wasn't like the other kids, you know, and she saw that and she was like, I got to get my son into something because he, I was those kids you bring around and like, I'm going to steal a show by either impersonating somebody, doing some dance move because it was weird. I wasn't never really the greatest at anything, but I knew how to do everything. Like, you know, whether it was music, dancing, you know, um, so my mom went in the Yellow Pages back in the day and found a dance school. Old school. Yeah, old school, Yellow Pages. Um, and she found Broadway Dance Center. And, um, you know, we went there and immediately let my, my life started changing. From yes. um, going and selling from the basic dance class to, like, within a few weeks, the intermediate advanced dance class where we met Rap City James. And Rap City James was, like, a huge, intricate part of the start of my life. She was the first person to, like, get me into different rooms that like I would probably win we probably wouldn't have gotten in if it wasn't for her. You know, she got me to dance with the Nick City kids and just her class was like it's it's so interesting the time this time in the world in the dance world, like these Wait, were you? So I was uh twelve maybe, give or take, twelve, okay. eleven. Yeah. And these classes was like shows within itself. Like Janet Jackson would come to just vet the class to see who was the hot dancers out. That's crazy. You know, like, Jermaine Dupri would just come to just chill in the class. Like, tweet, you know what I mean, when she was at her height. Missy Elliott would just come to these classes just to watch. That's so this is during that era where, like, if you was the, if you was the shit, you was in Broadway Dance Center and you was taking Rap City class. That's if you so was hard. in New York. And I was, at the time, the only kid. I was the only kid that was rocking, and people was like, who is this kid? But, like, very early on, we knew that, like, I could. I wasn't gonna be somebody background dancer. I just had a little bit more in me, you know. And it wasn't until somebody came to my mom and was like, "Yo, you know, this is after I'm now. I didn't dance with Alicia Keys, danced for the Knicks for a few years. I didn't, you know, did, done a few things in the dance world. Some guy came to my mom and was like, "Man, I got an acting agent. Which you ever thought about acting?" And my mom like, "Yeah, even though never, we never thought about it." Never took a class, never did anything. But she jumped at the she opportunity. She jumped at the opportunity, yeah, like, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. And then um, we went to this acting man, uh, management um, and had an interview with them. And then the very next day, they started sending me out on acting auditions. And then I never danced again. That's like, fire. I would audition so many times, like, so many. I would have an audition if it was Monday through Friday, I'd have on a f five auditions a week. And I just couldn't dance anymore. It just I just didn't have the time. So. From then on, it was it was just rocking. And what's the first role you got? Uh, the very first role. So I had did a few things. Like I had did like this Optimum Online commercial that was kind of popping. Optimum in Online, though. And it never heard of Yeah. So oh, this crazy. is the thing, right? It was back in the day. I don't know if y'all remember. The cable used to used to have to turn to a channel to see what was the TV guy. Yeah, yeah. And on yeah, the top yeah, of the cable, funny. or top of the channel, used to be commercials. So I was in this Hell commercial yeah. for like two seconds. But it just blew me up, like in my hood. Everybody, like, yo, could you have? I think about it. Everybody had to turn to this channel to, 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 to see that what was on. Yeah. So that commercial kept running. So I'm in it two seconds, and people like, oh, you was in a commercial on TV, <laughs> like. So that was my first one of my first gigs. Then I did a show called Hack on CBS okay. with Andre Brower. Um, and it's funny, my guy Chad Coleman. Chad is, uh, he played Cuddy on The Wire. He, he played my dad on this show. Um, so I did two episodes of that. It was like a Law & Order type of show back in the day. And then um, then I booked Miracle Boys, which was like the first lead role and the first one that kind of got me out there. And that was you and? Pooch Hall. Pooch Hall. Sean Nelson. Um, Pooch Hall from The Game. Sean Nelson from The Wood, Fresh. Uh, all those joints and um, Spike Lee was the director. Yeah, yeah, Spike was the director. And what happened with that? That ran for two episodes, three episodes. No, no. So it was a series, a mini series. Oh, okay. that, yeah. So we sh we my I booked the pilot for that project first, and we shot the pilot, and then it went a year. We went a year without hearing anything from it because you know when you sh shoot a pilot, you got to shop it, different things like that. And we went a year without hearing from it, and I just thought it was done. Like. 
And then we get a call and they're like, yeah, so the, the, the N network is picking a show up. The N was like the adult version, teen version of uh, Nickelodeon. Yeah. They're like, yeah, we picking a show up, but y'all got to re-audition. And we like, what? Like, we, we helped y'all sell the show. Now y'all want us three, me, Pooch, and Sean to re-audition. We like, what? So we had to go through the whole audition process again, but we all three end up getting it again. But... That audition process is crazy. Like we in there, cause we feeling like away a little bit. Like we were the people who were the characters, and now y'all trying to. We weren't. What are we not good enough? So, but it's right. just the business in hindsight. But like we went through that audition process. Spike had us in there improving. Like I right, just just go, just start talking. Just this is the situation. Go and we we was we went we went in there and rocked it. And um, yeah, and then we ended up doing the the actual series, the mini series, and um. You know, my life ain't been the same since. How was that working with Spike? You know, Spike, to have, like, my first real opportunity come from Spike was, like, a dream come true. You know, growing up, man, we grew up kind of tough. You know, I ain't have cable growing up for a long time. And, like, there would be moments where we would have, like, one DVD or one... What's DVD or something? One VHS, maybe. You watch it over and over. And we watching it every day. All day. Like, I couldn't go outside a lot when I was younger. You know what I mean? My mom used to... You know, have us in the crib, and we just like re-spinning DVDs. And one of the DVDs was uh, was Crooklyn, you know, and classic. You know what I mean? And I used to see myself through Crooklyn, you know, just watching these people, these young kids from Brooklyn. Which character, Wendell? Um, mainly the the main character, the young girl, I forget her name, Troy. Troy, Troy, yeah, Yeah, mainly Troy, because she was like the head of her household. You know what I mean? So I used to watch that and just be like, yo, this is crazy. This is dope. So then to have my first opportunity be by Spike, you know what I mean? And I've worked with him so many times since then. It's been like, you know, you can't ask for something better. Like Spike has started almost like 70% of the like African-American successful actors' careers. You know what I mean? Like, so to have Spike give me the opportunity was a blessing. Yeah, yeah. and y'all two are like the biggest Nick fans in, on, on yeah, Twitter. Yeah, 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 big Nick fans. You know, That's Spike like the mascot of the team, you know what I mean? Yeah, so. I seen him one time, uh, Nick Color, Mer- uh, Montclair on at my school. It's crazy. <laughs> Scott. Uh, so what age was that um, that you did that with Spike? Yeah, that was 13. Yeah, I was 13, going 14, going into 14 because I was a freshman in high school. I, yeah, freshman in high school. So I was old, my birthday ended uh, late later in the year. So I was um, always the youngest. So yeah, like early thirteen, early fourteen, and um, yeah, it was crazy, man. Like I didn't realize how big the show was going to be because I didn't watch the network. I didn't watch the end. You know, right. that wasn't a channel. I'm like, let me go watch Degrassi. I, that wasn't my type of speed. So I didn't realize like it was about to pop, and I'll never forget like. It went from like one day me being like a regular kid, quote unquote, to the commercials started dropping. And they were very dramatic with these commercials. Cause you know, it was like, this is, besides Degrassi, the N ain't have a lot. So they was like, they gonna promo the hell out of this show. And once the day they dropped that commercial, like, and said like, in, in two months, blah, 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 whatever, my, like, I couldn't walk down the street. The whole hood knew. Like, my hood knew like what I was doing already, but like once I went to school, I'll never forget. Like I walked into school and I just heard screaming, and I'm like, "Who? Why are they screaming?" Because this is during the Scream tour era, yeah. When fans, g- little girls didn't like come and ask for an autograph, ask for a picture. We didn't have phones money. like that. They just would scream, but they wouldn't like come up to me. They would just scream, and I'm walking in the cafeteria, before, you know, for the early morning, and I'm like, "Why is everybody screaming?" And then I look around and I realize everybody's looking at me. And then, like, every day from then on, like, I just, that was my life. Like, I'd have to get, like, the school safety to, like, escort me to my classrooms. Kids would, like, come by the classroom just to look in and so see. Was- and this is before the show even came out. It's just a commercial. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'll never forget, quick story, like, I'm on a bus going to school and... The, the 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 MTA, not the school bus. We didn't take school bus. So okay. Good. But uh, yeah. And these girls, I'm standing over them. They're sitting in the chairs. I'm standing holding the van. They're like, "Yo, you see that show, Miracle Boys, about to come out?" And the other girl, like, "Yeah." And she like, "Which which one you like?" 
And she's like, I like the young brother. That's the one for me. And I'm standing right over her. And she don't realize it. All she got to do is look up. And it's me. You know what I'm saying? So that's that was kind of like what I was going through. That's and I'm like, about. you know, when this show was coming on, you know? Yeah, so that what came next? Well, what came first? A Kill and the B or mm -hmm. The Wire? Yeah, A Kill and the B was next. Yeah. Um, How'd you land that? I, yeah, I did. First, I did a, a movie called The Wall Cap. Okay. With with Kiki Palmer, and that was my first film I did. Uh, Kiki Palmer, William William H Macy, William Macy, okay, William H Macy, um, from Pleasantville, yeah, from Shameless, you yeah, know, okay. go to me one of the greatest actors of all He's time. He's a problem. Um, we won an Emmy for that joint. Um, so that was a, a big movie. It was a TNT movie, and I at those that. times, that's when TNT movies was like was the shit, and. So we did that joint, me and Kiki had grew a cool relationship, you know, and her mom and my mom, um, shout out Miss Sharon, they, her mom, they, she was just dope. They were, they were like really good people. And Akela and the B came around. And when Akela and the B came around, they were looking for a brother to play Kiki's brother. And, you know, I think what, how, I might be a little off, but how the story went is that uh, Kiki's mom, hollered at my mom and was like, look, you, need, you better get out to LA. You know, they looking for a brother for this role. You know what I mean? And I, this is at the time where they wasn't really, not at the time, these are one of those situations where they, they cast within the city they're shooting in. They don't really cast outside because it's probably not that big of a role. So they don't want to be flying nobody out from New York. But we went in to this audition and I, I think for the most part, I rocked it. And they were like, all right, we're going to cast him even though he in New York and we shooting in LA. And um, so I got a kill in the B, and that was like, that really put me on a different level. You know, it was a, a film, everybody wanted to see it, a young girl in a spelling bee, um, a young black girl, you know what I mean? It was like the return of Angela Bassett and Lawrence Fishburne. You had never seen huge. them. You know what I'm saying? You yeah. never seen them together since What's Love Got to Do With It. Um, yeah, it was, it was a moment, it was a moment. And um, that was like my first like real film that put me out there. So mm -hmm. is that like when you really felt like, okay, like, I'm on some famous, you know what I mean? Nah, I, I never felt that way because you gotta realize, like, not on not on no cocky shit, but like, I always was like a kid that people fucked with. Like, I always like, you know what I'm saying? I, the, I'm telling you about the Miracle Boy situation. That was a few years before the Akil and the B, you know. So, and even before that, you know, I just always my my mom's kept us in the best clothes. You know, I was always that type of kid. So, acting did nothing for me fame wise in my head because I was always like Probably I always not. felt like I was cool you know what I'm saying yeah. and also I, I actually I hated being put on a pe pedestal you know what I mean like I'm those type of people where it's like when people are all going crazy and all that I kind of shy away from it because yeah. like who am I I ain't nobody that extra you know for me I look at it like I just learned lines and got in, put in an opportunity you know I ain't nobody I'm just like everybody else, you know what I'm saying? So for me, I didn't look at it no way. Fame really wasn't a thing of, for me personally. It was just like, I just got a job and I do it. Thanks, and I go man. back, because I was still going back to the hood, you know what I mean? Right, so right, it was right, like, right. it is and, what it is. And a lot of young actors, like, <clears throat> it's like either they become what people feel like are like super pricks or they get lost and start getting high, et cetera, et cetera. And this is before like the drugs got glorified. You know, yeah. we grew up, Anything other than we we viewed as crack. That's, that's a fact. So it's like, that's a fact. It's like, whoa, you. That's a fact. Ew. Yeah, I, I'm grateful that like drugs, all that, never was a part of my life. Like I didn't grow up in a family that was addicts. You know what I mean? Like drugs just never was a thing for me. So like I never dived in or delved into any of those things because it just wasn't my life. Okay. Yeah. But uh, so how did what came after? A Kill and a Bee, what mm -hmm. was the next one after that? So I was doing projects here and there throughout all of it, like Law and Order. I did like four episodes of Law and Order, like sporadically, um, a few different things. But then after that was, you know, the audition for The Wire. And that was just like a process within itself. How'd that come about? Um, it's funny, you know, um, so a week or two before I got The Wire audition, I had an audition for another project. and. They had a questionnaire for some reason and at the audition. And the questionnaire, they asked, like, what's your favorite TV show? And at the time, like, I'm outside, like, I ain't watching TV. You know, only thing I probably seen it was a uh, 106 in Park, you know what I mean? So I'm telling my mom, like, I don't know what to put. 
<laughs> and she like, you should put the wire. And I'm like, what's the wire? And she like, listen, it's it's a good show. And she, I remember her saying to me, if they ever have kids on this show, this show gonna be popping. Cause like, it was already, it couple, was already, you know, but the, the wire was like an adult, more of a, an adult show. Right. Like it was a show, like it wasn't kids, it wasn't geared towards teens or children. You know what I mean? So, but I remember her saying that to me. And then fast forward, like a week later, I get the audition for the wire, and um. They they were looking all over for these four kids. I mean, they were. It was I probably went up against tens of thousands of kids, you know, for the show. But I think it helped that I didn't know how big the show was. I think it helped that like also like I think very early on in my career, like I would go on auditions and like be unfazed about how big the sh project was. Like I'd just be like, all right, let's get it. Like right. you know what I mean? Like it, because I always looked at it like. I did Miracle Boys, I did A Kill in the Bee, I did all these projects and like, I've won in my life already, like Facts. in my head, you know what I'm saying? Like, I've done way more than I ever expected, especially because I never cared to be an actor, so the fact that I'm a known actor at this time is plus, I, I never thought I'd make it out the projects, the fact that, you know what I mean? So anything else was just extra for me. And uh, so I would go on these projects and these auditions and just be like, let's, I'm here, let's do it, like, let's rock. And I think that helped with my confidence and it also helped with like the nerves. You know, imagine like, so that's like me auditioning for Black Panther 3 right now. I ain't gonna front, like I've been doing this a long time, <laughs> but I'll be in there like, <sighs> you know what I mean? Yeah, just yeah, cause yeah. you know the gravity of like how big these projects are. But for me, early on, it was just it was just another day for me. So I think that helped, and um, I'll never forget going into audition, seeing like David Simon in there with his Baltimore Ravens jersey on, and I'm like, I don't know who this dude is. He looks serious, but like, and just rocking, man. And I think I, I think the moment I walked in, they was like, that's Naaman, that's 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 him, you know, because I was the first kid casted out of all three of the boys, okay. and then we had a, a process after that. But I was like one of the first. Uh, kids to be the like the cast member and then they look they used kind of like my chemistry with others to help them form the rest of the four the three boys so the other cast members had to read with you to kind of yeah so they had a joint where we went to Baltimore they sent us out there and um they had like a chemistry test so they had like two two guys that were gonna play Michael two Dukies two um uh Randy's I never forget they had picked me up from my crib and then they were the guys like oh my next stop is uh, right around the corner and i'm like where so he drives around the corner picks this other kid up who's auditioning for michael and me and him so now we ride into the city together we get on a train together to baltimore and i'm we so we vibing now for three four hours i'm like oh this is gonna be dope he live in my neighborhood it's gonna be a good time and then i get there and tristan tristan wiles is in the audition in baltimore and i'm like i knew tristan wiles for years now at this oh, point you already like, knew him he was on he was he came on miracle boys for one episode we, we got really cool throughout that process and like so that was my guy so now I get there and I see this kid I've been vibing with for four hours and I'm like, this is my dude over here, you know what I'm saying? So I'm now hoping he gets the role. So, um, and and then, yeah, so, and then my homeboy, uh, I don't know if he's going to want me to say this wrong, kid. Uh, my boy TJ, <laughs> my boy TJ, he had auditioned for Dookie. TJ uh, is a rapper, good dude, good dude. He be with Chris Brown a lot. He auditioned for Dookie. So I knew him, f uh, uh, no, I hadn't met him there, but... He was from Harlem, so I was like, oh, all right, like, we gonna rock. But then, you know, I guess they wanted a different a different vibe for, yeah. for the Dookie character. But yeah, when I got there, it was, you know, but we all had chemistry readings, and they had to see who, which kids kind of vibe together, who looks wise, maybe also, you know, height, different things like that. Um, but they were, I, I, th I was the only naming, though. Like, it was only, I was the only one at the audition for mine. Yeah. And a lot of people that watch The Wire, they feel like season four is the best season. Boys mm -hmm. of the Summer, right? Yeah. The, yeah. A lot of people feel like that's the best. I mean, even you just said, I mean, Naaman's character is yeah. super relatable. Toxic mom, street dad. Dookie's character is one of the most depressing, like, downward yeah. spirals. It'll make you cry when he putting that needle in his arm in the oh. on, on that last montage at the yeah. end of the season. It's disgusting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think to me, for the most relatable kind of like characters in TV history. I mean, you had a season 
the show up until this point was led by adults, led by like some of some great actors. And then this season, they're like, all right, we're going to have these four boys lead the show. You know, all of the people who were mainly the main characters of the show up until this point kind of took a step back. Like, you know, the McNulty yeah. character, I believe there was like word that he did, he wanted to kind of like slow down and be a, you know, be with his family, right. you know, so they kind of made him the beat cop so that he could spend less time all the way in Baltimore and he lived in probably, I believe it was like Ireland or something, right? Like, so they, they, they put the show on these kids back, you know what I mean? And though just the storyline within itself, the fact that you're watching how criminals, how drug dealers, how politicians, how how they become this. You don't just turn to the streets or you don't just turn into what some may call criminals overnight. It's a process. It's also a, a system that allows you and, and, and forces you into this world and you get to see it in, in 3D, in your face, and they chose to, you know, go the school system route. And, it's, and then they introduced these kids. And you really see the truth about what young kids in the inner cities go through, man. Like, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking watching it. You know, even me, I don't really watch the show. I've only watched it maybe, give or take, three or four times in its entirety. But, like, it's hard to watch as an adult because it's like, those kids didn't deserve that. You know, and you watch the show, and there's a moment in each kid's life that's a, a life-changing moment. And most of it, you know, my character, spoiler alert, my character got out, but... Maybe the, the only th happy ending? Right, with the only happy ending probably in the show. If you call it that. One of the only, out of like four happy endings in The Wire, in its entirety, my character's one, you know? But, like, to see what happened with the other three boys and how the world failed them at every chance... You know what I mean? Like, watch Randy's character. Like, he, if he would have had support from the cops, when he kept asking for support, he wouldn't have been in the situation he was in, right? And it was all their negligence and not understanding how serious it was he needed help, not understanding that, like, yeah, these are young boys and he may just be an informant to you, but this kid actually needs help. And you don't understand what... Y'all slacking going to do to these kids, you know? Thankfully, it was a guy, Bunny Coven, in the school system that actually cared enough about the kid to, to help support him in getting out. But, like, all throughout the show, you just watch the, the, the system fail these kids, and it's, it's unfortunate, man. Yeah, yeah, and I wouldn't even, <clears throat> I mean, like, I would be a little remiss to say Naaman had a happy ending because he still, at the end of the day, lost his dad to the uh, yeah. to the jails and his mom, who knows what's going on, but either way, he got displaced. Yeah. And yeah. at the end of the day, you, you may not be happy at home, but you still love your parents. You did. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And you, you grateful that, like, somebody cared enough for you. Like, you got to think about it. A lot of people say, like, Bunny Colvin saved Naaman, but he didn't necessarily. WeeBay saved Naaman. Because that conversation. It, was, it was WeeBay's decision. Because all WeeBay had to do was say, nah, my son is staying there with his mother. Thanks. And it, his life could have went in a completely different direction. But he chose to understand and say, look at my situation. Look where I'm at. I ain't never coming home. I want it's different from my son. So it took him to step up and, and really love his kid enough to let him go. And, and, and that was, was powerful. That's a fact. So if they were going to do a reboot for The Wire, they probably could actually do it based on just you four, the uh, Boys yeah. of the Summer. Yeah. I mean, it'll never happen, probably, just because David Simon is, like, a very stickler on his art. And he, right. He's not one to just give in to, like, what the people want, what fans want. You know, because a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And sometimes we drag it with the, like, stories. Like, how many shows have we seen where we're like, eh, after season four, I was over it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, David Simon, what you got to respect, he's just like, nah, that's the end. I wrote, this is the story I wrote. And if you want to see a continuation of The Wire, look outside. That's fire. Because yeah. The Wire... The, the, the stories never change. The system has not changed. So if you want to see what happened to Naaman, look outside. And go, go, you can look at any inner city, any projects, 
or just anybody that's successful that's trying out here look at you can look outside and see the continuation of the wire yeah, you don't need to to watch it dramatically that's a fact yeah so at when the, t the end of season four you were how old i was f when i came back from the wire i was 15 going into 16. And we're, you was living still in Brooklyn? Yep, still living in the project. So people don't know, like, we shot The Wire for a year in Baltimore. And every weekend I would come home to Brooklyn because my mom, uh, we had my brothers and sisters. So she, you know, throughout the week we was out there. She, my oldest brother was watching my youngest brother. And then at home, at, on the weekends, we'd come home and she would, uh, you know, watch my little brother. <laughs> so, like, yeah, it was... It was it was a lot, man. Like going back and forth. Imagine I'm shooting Monday through Friday, seven a.m., six a.m. to nine p.m., and then on the weekends I didn't even really get a chance to relax. It was just like straight from set on Friday to the Grand Greyhound, and then back to Baltimore Sunday night. Like, so how was that? Being on TV, you maybe not feeling like a star, mm -hmm. but the world is going to amplify everything you do either way, especially in the No, movie. I'm definitely a star at the time. I'm okay. Like, yeah, I'm not yeah, even talk heavy. Gas. Like, talk heavy. No, I'm just saying, like, I may not have felt the fame per se, but nah, like, I'm riding on the bus and the poster for the wire is on the side of the bus that see, I'm riding on. See, that's crazy. Yeah. It so was, it's like. It was different. And, and so if you are. F famous or star, pardon me, if you are famous or a star, yeah. it always gets amplified in the hood. So it's like, how is that being on TV and then coming back to the P's, come back to the projects? It's like, you know, how do people treat you? Yeah, it was, um, you know, one thing I, um, one thing I always would respect from my city, from my, from my hood, is that like people show love. You know, whether it was, even if it, if there was hate, it was never blatant. You know, like people show love because I never came off as a person who felt better than people. You know, what I mean, I never walked around stunting, you know, flexing on people. For me, right. it was just like they know who I am. You know what I mean? They know they know what it is. So people show love, man. I got a lot of love, you know, and the wires those type of shows where like you get love from people if you on the wire. Like, yeah, like almost every celebrity I've met for the most part have come up to me first to show they love for the wire. Like, I've never really been the type that, like, I'm going to go to a celebrity and say, what's up? I'm going to go up to a rapper. And, like, most of the relationships I have with rappers are because they are fans of the show. That's an East Coast mentality. Yeah, East Coast you know, mentality. I'm walk up to anybody. I'm not walking up to nobody <laughs> per se unless it's somebody I truly admire. I ain't, yeah, yeah, I ain't, yeah. I got, I, I, I'm not that, you know, I don't have that big of an ego. If it's if I see Hove, I'm walking up to Hove. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Like. Fair. But, like, nah, people show love, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm very grateful for the life that I had, especially at that time. Because it could have went any way. You know, I could have been violated. I could have been disrespected, you know. But I didn't carry myself in a way that, like, number one, you're going to play with me like that. And number two, that, like, I, 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 I'm asking for that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I had instances, and that's just natural instances in the hood, but never because, like, of any type of fame or anything, like, it, people show love. Right, yeah. so you didn't get into like, because this is before social media. Yeah. So that's why I asked because it's like now, it's like there's no mystique to anybody on TV. Mm -hmm. You can DM Halle Berry and, you know. Yeah. If she feeling like it, she'll write you back. Yeah, probably. right. Or yeah, at least it gets read. Right. That's crazy. Right. Hit like on the comment. The most that I would see from the outside world is like, at first we had Sconex, and that was like a message board for like high school. I, I remember Sconex. You know what I'm saying? So Sconex, you'd see message boards, and you'd see like, I believe they were called um, just chats, just message boards about shows. So and, they had, and yeah, you know what I'm saying? Oh, say? chat rooms. Yeah, chat rooms maybe, but like it'll be about a specific thing. Like okay. this, this message board is about miracle book reddit before reddit yeah exactly reddit before reddit so i would see like people talking about my acne a little bit you know what i mean oh yeah, and yeah. during miracle boys era or talk about how you know how cute i was things like that but you would just see it and then it would be it once you turn the computer off it's over yeah right because we didn't have phones like that now social media you watching consistently all day it follows somebody's you. experience that's a you. fact all day long it's 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 nuts we didn't. I'm grateful for the era I grew up in. Yeah. So while you were filming the wire, you had a girlfriend at the time. Uh, did I have a? I had many girlfriends at the time. No, I I had like, damn, I can't even remember during the wire. Not yo, I, I don't believe I really had like one girl because it was. Oh. Just, it was so no like 
I really did not have the time, yo. Like the wire was so time consuming. Like what were they what they were asking for us is like these four boys to do on a consistent ba- like daily basis. The schedule was, was crazy. It was crazy, bro. Like I had no time for nobody. Like any girl that I probably was talking to, I probably lost during that era, during okay. that time cuz it was just so much, man. But naturally, you know, you're, you're hanging out in Baltimore, so yeah. Oh yeah, we well, were you, wilding. Yeah, we yeah, wilding. We're, we're about to go there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you were you already you getting pussy before the wire? Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I lost my virginity pretty young. So, yeah, when what the wire age? came about, I lost my virginity at 14. Okay. That's yeah, at 14. So, when the wire came, like, I mean, I wasn't really wild. It was just, you got to think about it. Most of those scenes early on, especially, was in schools. Facts. So, like, you know, like, we we met women that we liked throughout the process during those school scenes and you know, but it, we weren't wilding like that, though. Like, we were chilling. It was just, we were young, man. You put, like, four teens in, in, in like, a situation where they're, like, movie stars now. And they're, like, asked to, like, we ain't going to school. Only school we really have is the tutoring on the set. Right. Like, you know, we, we left our demises for the most part. But for me, my situation was a little different because my mom... We, my mom was with me every day, all day. Okay. Like, you know, Tris was out there. Tris, his brother and sister took turns coming out there. Uh, Maestro, his parents. But, like, my mom was, like, with me everywhere. We even stayed in a bed and breakfast that was, like, two beds in one room. So I didn't really have a lot of time. That's why when I would come home on the weekends, I would really, like, just be free and let go because it was, like, I'm living with my mother Monday through Friday, every day, all day, in one room. Like, whether I, if I'm not on the set, I'm in this room with my mother. Like, okay. so I'll go to a little coffee shop on the corner of my crib and kind of get away, be in the bathroom on the phone, trying to get away. Like, so when I come home to Brooklyn, like on the weekends, we would turn up. Like, so when you came home, the pussy race skyrocketed. It was, it was through nice. the roof. It was through the roof. It was bad. It was bad. But like, I never was like pressed though. I never was pressed. Cause I always felt like I, I never was without, you know what I'm saying? Like not on no funny shit, but like I just never, like I wasn't the people who used my fame to get <coughs> women. Like I never really was that without. So like I always was more so on some like chill shit. Like and I think that's what like women fucked with the most. They was just like he don't even be fiending. Like he don't be boasting. He don't be bragging. Like. He, like, son be chilling, and they wanted, that's what made him want me more. And also, I was dealing with a lot of older women at the time, so, like, you know, I wasn't on some, like, dealing with the hothead young girls, you know what I mean? You like, like a cougar. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, we didn't call them cougars back then. I just had more in common with older women, you know what I mean? Like, I'm at this time, I'm paying the bills in my crib, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not even in school, you know what I mean? I'm I'm, I'm living a completely different life. Like, at, at that time, no, no sophomore in high school could relate to my life. You know okay. what I'm saying? Like, right. I couldn't have a, a something in common with a, a 15-year-old, 16-year-old. You know what I'm saying? I'm living a completely different life over here. So it just so happened that older women was really just my speed. So you were 15 dealing with, like, 20-year-olds, 25, 30, 40? Give or take, yeah. To, okay. oh, oldest at that time was probably, like, 30, 31. Yeah, when I was, like, 16, 17. I know it's, like, horrible to say in hindsight, but like that just was my experience. It's a different time. Different time. Different time. Anybody in the industry? Uh yeah, yeah, you know, a few. A few. I had a few friends in the industry, you know, a few people, few women I dated in the industry. You wanna share? I mean do you, I don't know. <laughs> nah, I mean, what you know, I, mean, I don't I, know. I, I see you see Twitter talk sometimes, people assume that you uh dealt with Kiki Palmer. No. Yeah. Never. I uh but you know, anytime you're Kiki seeing... was always my yo. It's even weird seeing Kiki now because I remember like the day I met Kiki and she was like this young. Even though we're only like three years apart, I believe. Like just meeting Kiki and being like, this is like she's such a young girl. Like Kiki was such a young little quirky woman when she was a kid. Like she was also always ahead of the game, but like Kiki was just like those annoying little sisters. You right. know what I mean? So even when as we grow older, like I. She's just like my sister. You know what I mean? I would never even look at her in that way. Yeah. Okay. The word rumors you dated SZA. <laughs> TDE or yeah, SZA. Yeah, yeah. me and SZA, was, uh, we dated for a little bit. Um, she's just, 
dope chick. You know what I mean? Dope chick. Probably one of the only, I would say, like, situations that, like, I look back on it and be like, damn, I could have been a little different. But, you know, SZA, she lived, Solana, I, I can't, it bothers me to say SZA. Solana, she lived in Jersey at the time, and I lived in Brooklyn, and it was just so far. You know, like, we just couldn't never really, like, get with each other as much as we wanted to. Um, but, yeah, me, me and SZA dated for a little bit. How, how'd you meet? I don't even remember. I don't know. Did me, I feel like me and SZA met through social media, maybe. Maybe. Early days? It's early days. So I'm like, not MySpace, but I wouldn't put it past MySpace. Yeah, because we dated when I was like, we we talked up until my 20s. So, okay. Yeah, so so it was, we, we talked for a little minute. It wasn't, I wouldn't say it was anything crazy, but like, I think, you know, the distance kind of, you know, messed up what we had, but like, yeah, I, I don't remember how I met her. So but. it wasn't anything like you got caught cheating. Nah, that's what I was saying. That's Girls probably honestly, house, honestly pulling up. Nah, that's honestly one of the only situations where they did in like on some crazy like I, you know dramatic shit. Like me and sister just you know still cool to this day. You know she hollers at me here and there. I holler at her. You know it's crazy how like I didn't know she was a celebrity until like years and years like. Last time I seen SZA, she had, uh, came to my crib. Just this, I had just got my f first crib, if I'm not mistaken. And she came through, and I remember she was like, "I had just got a MacBook, and it had GarageBand on it. And on a GarageBand, you could like record yourself over a record." Fact. And I never forget. She was like, "Yo, I be singing. Like I like singing and shit." And I'm like, "Where?" I'm like, "Let me see." So on my computer, I have an audio of SZA singing. Frank Ocean's thinking about you, like singing it. You still have it? Uh, probably somewhere. We need to hear that. <laughs> we gotta hear that. So like that was I didn't even know, and then years later I had thought about her, and I was like, let me holler at Solana and see what she up to, and I text her, and we talking blah blah blah, and then we exchange social medias, and she's like, hers is SZA, and I'm like, what? What that? Okay, and I look it up, and she verified. She got a million followers, and I'm like. Who the fuck are you? <laughs> like, what do you do, my nigga? Like, why do you have a million followers? Because I remember this girl is just me and a Regular. girl from Jersey. Thanks. And she's like, yo, I'll be singing now for real. And I'm like, sign to Kendrick. And and then a week later, I hear this record with her and Travis Scott. And That's I'm like, because I didn't listen to the underground R&B at that time. So, like, I didn't know she was popping. But I'm so, like, proud of her and everything she's doing and, and you know. I can't wait for her, her next album. To come yeah, that's dope. That's fire. Yeah. So you prefer dating industry chicks or no. like civilians? I, I <laughs> civilians is not funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd rather you know women that's not in the industry. Just just simply because industry women are good, are dope, but they're just it's the time, man. Like especially if you're dating one that's successful, that's really like getting to it they ain't never really gonna have time for you. You know what I mean? Like, it's unfortunate, but like, you gotta really have tough skin to date someone in the industry. I'm very clear on that. And, you know, between scheduling, schedule conflicts, between just like all the other shit that comes with fame, like, it's a lot. It's, I'd much rather a person that's just... The million dudes in an inbox. Yeah, you know, I mean, if you're beautiful, you're gonna have a million dudes in the inbox. That's true, if you Even if... You ain't that good on the eyes. You're going to have a million dudes on the inbox. True. But, like, it's just the other stuff that come with it. You know, the insecurities that probably comes with fame. The, you know, the the dire need to be, like, to, to hustle and to be successful. That's also can sometimes be a, a detriment in a relationship because you're trying so hard on in this area that you start to slack in other areas, you know. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's just a, a bunch of different situations that like to me just doesn't work for what i want in a relationship you know but I mean? all right that, when you date uh i will call a civilian yeah they don't understand the process that goes with it the unorthodox hours yeah. the 3 a.m phone calls that are actually business you know yep. Julito, yep. we gotta be, come to maryland to, tomorrow 10 p 10 a.m yep. Yep. You know, they think everything is something. Yeah. You know, you're going to be around beautiful women. You're going to be around basically everything that they think that you want. 
Right. So right. How it's, you, you damned if you do or you damned if you don't, I'm not gonna lie. You know what I mean? Like you just gotta trust that you choose wisely, you know, trust that that you know the person you're dealing with and, and hope and, and hope that y'all can communicate well enough to to understand each other, to understand what's going on. I mean, I've had many instances where like the this industry fucked up a relationship I had, you know, and but that just meant it wasn't for me. For real, for real. You know what I mean? Like, Fair. but it's tough, man. Like, like I said, you can't, sometimes you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Yeah. And then that makes me think at the same time, what's better, industry friends or civilian friends? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, how do you gauge what's real or who's around you for a come up? I've always had a good idea of people. Okay. Like, since a kid. Like, I always knew, like, I'm, I'm like an a empath. Like, I feel vibes and energy very strongly and deeply. So if you're around me for a very specific thing, I'm going I'm to I'm see it early on. Like, if you don't have the best intentions for me or for us, I'm going to see it. You know, and, and that's what helps me navigate through the world. You know, like, I see through that shit. And people are not that great at actors, especially in their, like, real life. So they're going to show themselves. Because I've always been the type that, like, I believe you when you talk. I believe the shit you say. I believe not just the shit you say to me. I believe the shit you say to other people as well, about other people. Okay. So, like, I've always been really good at, like, what's the word? Discernment? You know, I've always had great discernment in people. So, I'm never, I'm never really had to have that kind of so situation. You, you, you don't do, okay, so you haven't had anybody come around and had to get kicked out. Of course, okay. of course, but I'm usually on it early. Okay. Like I'm usually on it early, like because the people, it's people are telling themselves, you know, they're yeah. telling themselves, and it's they don't even got nothing to do necessarily with just being in the industry, like just being around people in general, just humans, like they we'll tell on ourselves yeah. very early on. So I've always had good discernment. And there's a phrase that says, um, which I think applies. It, it they say a friendship funded off of business is better than a business funded off friendship. Mm. So I think it kind of has a application for this because it's like. You know, if you, it's not exact, you know, translation, but it's like meeting somebody after already kind of being lit, so to say, mm -hmm. it may be a harder process to yeah. like kind of find somebody genuine versus somebody who you meet that's kind of like your equal in mm -hmm. that, or you meet on some, on some business and y'all become kind of like us. We met on business yeah. and then we just organically, organically kind of clicked. It wasn't yeah. forced. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I get that, 100%. And at the same time, people, even that's your peers in the industry, could be using you for something. Street like, there's a lot of relationships in the industry that's fake as fuck. Yeah. They literally use each other for promo. They use each other for, like, Twitter clicks and clickbait. Yeah. There's <laughs> mad relationships that are not real that people think are real relationships. There's mad open relationships in the industry that you think, oh, this person cheat. So when it come out when a person cheat, everybody's surprised. And them people been in open relationships their whole relationship. You know what I mean? Like, it's a lot of fake shit within the industry as well. So, like, that's why I say you kind of damned if you do, damned if you True. don't. You know? Yeah, they, they always say there's, a, like, a, for instance, the little Dirk and Dej Loaf. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, are yeah. they really dating? Yeah. I mean, I don't know about them in particular, but you know, like, right. You... We, like, did we ever really see them together outside the music video? Right. And at the same time, I'm not a person that always look at, like, what is seen is true. Because you don't know how these people's lives are behind the scenes. You know what I'm saying? Like, they probably were together, you know? So it's just always just looking at things and, like, is it real or not? You know what I mean? And um, also not, like, judging what we see, what's, what's put out there for us to see. Because it should be completely different. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. So, going back to the career, after The Wire, what was your next big look? Um, after The Wire, there were just many other looks. I mean, there was Brotherly Love, um, there were Mr. and Pete, you know, The Inevitable Defeat of one Mr. Of and favorites. Pete. Yeah, one of my favorite films as well. Um, shout out to George Tillman Jr. He did Soul Food. He was a director at that. And, you know, Alicia Keys produced that, which was like a full circle moment. I used to dance with her back in the day when I was like 12, 13, and now she's producing a film that I'm in. Um, yeah, there were just a bunch of different moments throughout that. The, you know, The Wire kind of opened me up 
to a different like level of like success and um at the same time you know there was some faults in that you know what i mean because there's certain ways that we in my career we should have went per se and um when you got to realize none of this were we planned for none of this were we like studied for my mom was just like i said a hustler in the street that was trying to figure it out so none of this was we was ready for it maybe there were a lot of instances where we should have did things differently but when you just don't know, you don't know. And you can't fault somebody for not knowing. You, right. We have family from the hood, you know what I mean? Like most of these actors that like pop, they're usually coming from like acting schools and families. Juilliard. Who, who, Juilliard and or families who were well off already. So, so we did a lot of things out of desperation. You know what I'm saying? Out of like, when you're desperate, you'll take anything. You'll take any contract. You'll take any project. Or, you know what I mean? We did a lot of things out of not knowing, out of ignorance, you know, lack of knowledge. So, Did you find yourself in a bad contract? Well, I, I mean, who, know, who knows, right? Like, at this point, I'm th thinking, like, sure, maybe you look at The Wire, you got four kids being the lead of a show and the amount of work we were doing. If you want to compare our contracts to, like, the Sopranos contracts, I mean, granted, they were a show that was on for... But, like, I'm sure we didn't get paid as much as we, we could have. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um... I was still living in projects. Do you feel like you should have moved out? <laughs> well, I, I did move out as soon as I got back from the wire, but okay. like, you know, it wasn't about wanting to move out or not. Who wants to live in the projects? I, it was about like, my mom had seven kids, six kids, you know what I'm saying? At the time, it's like, can, can we afford moving out? And yeah, like, true. we weren't that financially stable prior and like one project is not going to, turn it all you know turn your life upside down like it's not gonna take you out from the hood to hollywood so like but i do think there were instances where things could have been like i i believe i never really said this on camera before but like i really i don't have regrets but i do wish that right after the why i went to college yeah i do wish that right after the why i went to did like four years of college you know went to an hbcu you know, went studied acting, you know what I mean? I wish I would have, but you can't, it's hard to say that when you're in the middle of it, you know what I mean? It's hard to say that when you like, I just did this big show, all of these yeah. other things, opportunities are coming, like, I, but in hindsight, I'm, I wish I would I remember we, that. we talked about that one time, you saying that, and you know, I went to school and, and it's like, on the other side, we wish we was yeah. on, you know, getting cooking in the industry yeah so it's like it goes both ways, it goes both ways. Yeah. but it's like i just think for me it wasn't even necessarily about like what it could do for me in the industry just maybe what it could do for me as, like, a, man. as a man okay. as, a, as like mentally you know because i was extremely depressed during the wire you know what i mean it was a very hard year for me like i was very like in, when i look back at it you know i was very depressed very like it was a lot you know um my life up until that point wasn't the greatest also, you know? So I came from a lot of like depression and like sadness and like, and my mom probably also went through a, a lot of depression at this time. So like, it was a lot of things that like could have been different, you know what I mean? Or should have maybe been different, but like, you know, I don't regret anything because it, it, it made me into who I am today. And you know, without those, struggles I you know I wouldn't even understand struggling to then help someone else you know what I mean yeah did, did you fit did well you had a tutor on set did you end up finishing high school no so I didn't finish high school because we worked so much we never really had time to get with the tutor so like technically by law we should have been like doing I believe it was three hours a day in tutoring on set a day but you go one day and you only do one hour. So you got to bang two hours for the next day. Then that's five hours. And then you only do two hours the next day. Then that's another one hour bank. Though. So we had banked so many hours by the end of the wire where it was like, it was so much. And New York schools at the time, especially public schools, they weren't prepared to have a child go to their school that's an actor. Thanks. So they didn't really have the packet. They didn't really know what packages to send us to have us do work on. And that's why, you know, my mom really, really wanted me to go to a performing arts high school. 
But at the time, I'm already acting. I'm already popping. In the industry, I'm like, I don't want to go to a performing arts school. And now I'm around nothing but actors. And in the hindsight, I should have done it. Right. It would have been smarter. But at the same time, it's like, I ain't want to be around a bunch of industry people. I still don't want to be around a bunch of industry niggas. It's you know like what I'm saying? That work after work. I, right. Work after work or during work or before work. You know, I'm like, nah, I always wanted to be around people that was just yeah just cool you know what i mean like industry people can be very weird so i always like shunned away from industry people so yeah so like i, I wasn't able to finish high school because we just wasn't prepared for okay. you know this this movie set life you know and yeah how'd you get the uh ludicrous video runaway girl yeah runaway love yeah oh, runaway so, love part yeah of. yeah um so actually um, God rest his soul, John Singleton. Uh, he uh, he he requested me to be in the pro in the movie in the video. But the thing was, John Single was Singleton was supposed to direct it, and then scheduling conflicts happened, so he wasn't able to do it. But I was still in the video. Um, shout out Jesse Terrero. He ended up directing it. But like, it just so happened that like me and Kiki back at it. You know what I mean? We had did. Um, the wool cap, then we did a kill in the bee, and then now we in LA doing the runaway love video, you know, and and that was fire because Mary J. Blige is somebody that like my mom admired growing up. That's all I heard in my house every single day and she got to meet her? Yeah, I believe she did get to meet her during that time. Um no, actually she didn't. It was only Ludo on set the day I shot. Okay. Um but just to even being something with Mary is like yeah. classic, you and know. That, but the video was like a movie. Yeah, it was a mini movie. We we won the BT uh, Video of the Year. You know what I mean? Uh, I should have. I don't know if I, the uh, Grammys got like a video car category. We should have won that. That video was powerful, man. It had uh, some great actors in it. You know what I mean? Like it was it was powerful, powerful, especially at that time. You know what I mean? What Luda and Mary was doing was like. You never really seen music videos pop like about that type of content. You know yeah, what I mean? that's a fact. It so was, it, it was powerful. And, you know, me and Kiki Rod. I still get people like, "Damn, why you did that to that young girl?" I'm yeah, like, it was crazy. I'm like, it's a big music video. <laughs> did you keep the baby. You're right. Did you keep the baby. <laughs> no, but it was like number one on 106 for probably yeah, over a month. Yeah, it had to be. we were number one on 106 for for like two, three months, bro. Like, that was crazy. It was, it was a good time. Good time. All right, so. Right now, uh, moving back to like film and industry, mm. like there's a surge, a, a surge um, of independent content. Yeah. So like, how do you feel about like independent? Well, actors actually putting out their own content mm -hmm. versus you know waiting for you know the industry to come get you. You know, because like back in the day, it seems like once you were at a movie, you didn't want to go back down to a show. But yeah. now. They're killing for like a, a series. Yeah, yeah. Um, number one, I think most projects as we see are independent. Number one, if it ain't like a Marvel superhero, if it ain't got like like that type of vibe, it's probably an independent project. That just means independently funded by a producer or you know, a, it, it's just not like the machine. So I'm I'm all for it because to me that'd be the you know the the best projects are independent projects you know what i mean the best projects are the projects that are that don't got the most money that's out here just willing and dealing trying to figure it out because that's the best that's the art that like they ain't willing to put the million hundred million dollars on because it's the stories ain't really to them big sellers but then you see certain projects and you're like look this was an like mr p mr and p you know what i mean but if you want to even go on a higher level moonlight Oh, okay. Moonlight, you know, they won an Oscar for Best Movie, Best Picture. If you really think about it, almost every movie that has won Best Picture in the last five, ten years are independent projects. Oh, I, okay. You so, know what I mean? So it's like, I'd much rather do work that means something than to do work that just sells something. Okay. And, you know, The Wire, people don't know, The Wire work, it didn't have the most viewers. It didn't have great ratings. It didn't have great viewership. You know what I mean? But we still talk about The Wire 20 years later. And what show do you know that people are still talking about? Dramatic show. Could we still talk about the Martins and the Friends and all of these shows? Like, those are 
network television sitcoms. What dramatic show do you know they still talk about every other day on social media? Almost every single one of the cast members at The Wire are still consistently working. There's no project that has come out in the last 10 years that don't got somebody from The Wire in it. You know, like, we're celebrating 20 years. You said, what show do you know besides the Martins that they're celebrating 20 years for? Like, and making it a big deal. You know what I mean? And that's, and we didn't have, we didn't win any Emmys. Got nominated, I believe, once for a writing Right, like a writing up uh, episode of you know, it's just like, what show do you know that essentially got no accolades, viewership wasn't the greatest, but still talked about twenty years later. The Wire is uh, always in the argument of best series. Period. Period. Yeah. The Wire, Sopranos, it's mm-hmm. in that conversation always, consistently. But Sopranos has tons of as- accolades. Uh, yeah. Now, the most obvious thing is Sopranos is an all white cast, yeah. majority white cast. The Wire is majority black cast, mm-hmm. and it's like authentic Baltimore. If you've ever been to yeah. Baltimore, The Wire might even be watered down. You're right. So it's like, do you think it being an all black cast, majority black cast, that has something to do with well, you guys? Well, of course. Of course. I mean, you know, it, and, and that's the crazy thing. It wasn't a black show. Right. Right? People like to put that on shows. I don't even know what that means, honestly, a black show, I guess predominantly black people on it, but like The Wire wasn't even a hood show. People like to put that tag on it. The Wire was a show about systems. The oh. systems just happen to be in the hood because those are the most of the systems that are dis- uh, that are ruining the industry, the world, right? But, um, and that's where they push those narratives into. Um, but yeah, The Wire didn't get half of the accolades, not even 10% of the accolades that The Sopranos got or Breaking Bad got or any of these shows got. Um, And it's super unfortunate, you know, because if you look at a show like The Wire, for it to be in the conversations for the greatest TV shows of all time, not like the greatest hood shows or black shows, the greatest shows of all time, if you look at that conversation, if you look at all of the actors that The Wire has has like branched and created from the Michael B. Jordans, it's just Elvis Wood Harris, and for us to not get any accolades is, is blasphemy. I agree. You you hit a good fact with that because at the end of the day, when it's a majority white cast, they like to just call it film, TV, whatever. Right. When it's a majority black cast, it's always black movie, black cinema. Yep. Or hood film, hood cinema. Um, it's almost like we have to be a subcategory when our narratives are just as important. Yeah. Or it could even be a better story. You know, Most of the you, times it is. You just, ne- it's more layers and, and context and more colors with our stories. You know what I mean? Yeah, and our stories are more than slavery and more than what, the, the, what they want to push. We have so many stories. That's why I love a story like Mr. and Pete, right? That's why I also love stories like Abbott Elementary. Right, because Fire. it's like there's so many different layers to being a person of color. That's more than just what the world wants you to see. You know? Yeah, that's a fact. Um, it's it's more to the slave narratives. It's more than cocaine dealers. It's more than no disrespect to that, but it's more than well, more than reality TV. Yeah, we don't even have to say what shows we're talking about, yeah. but it's it's more than that. You know, it's like they want us to be yelling and arguing. Yeah, but when it's peaceful. It get canceled. Absolutely, <laughs> you know. But and uh, and I also think that we get to play a part in that because we got to be mindful of the things we create as producers and writers and and like you know, just true. We got to just be mindful of it all. If we're gonna feed into the narrative, we can't complain about the narrative, you know. So I I, I do, but you at the same time got to do what you got to do to survive and, and 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 make and you know. There's a lane for those things. There's eyes for those things, but like. At the same time, it's like, what type of content are we trying to make? Like, I want to see more projects about HBCUs. I want to see more projects about just, like, I would love to see another Akilah in the Bee. You know what I mean? Like, to see a young black girl in a spelling bee, like, it took how many years? Just two years ago, a year ago, the young black girl finally won? Like, yeah, that's yeah. a real 
story. You know what I mean? How about young geeks? You know what I mean? Young black geeks that are not always de- getting bullied. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, what about those stories? Geeks. Like, you know, they're not all geeks get bullied. Yeah, you know what I mean? That's like, a fact. not all geeks get bullied. It's not that's not the and, story. And not all smart kids are geeks. And not all smart kids are geeks. I know mad fly. I was in all of the smart classes growing up. Yeah, same. and hung out with all the kids who was selling drugs and all that. Yeah. And when I go to school, I was in all of the, you know, advanced classes. Like we get to tell those stories too. Like that's a fact. Because everybody that's, you know, everybody in the hood is not street nigga. You know, some people Absolutely. watch from the window, some people watch from the porch, some people actually go get dirty, you know, mm-hmm. but, you know, a lot of, a lot of niggas just play the block, because that's our friends. Yeah, you that's know, it's, it. It's you, like, you, sometimes just as, as uh, you know, it, it's a product of your environment. You know, we fact. hear that all the time. Like, most of my friends don't want to be in the streets, for real. They just have no choice. In their mind, they have no other choice. Or what the world tells us, the system tells us, we have no choice. But like a lot of people, would much rather go to the, you know, do shit that's that's outside of that. You know, it's just I just want to see those stories. You know, what I mean, I just want to see stories that are different, and that's what I've I've been blessed to kind of tell in my career stories that are just different. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm glad you said that. So, you know, we got to talk about it. Let's now, talk about God it. bless you, the movie. Yeah, yeah. Four yeah. million views. Come on, man. Come on, <laughs> talk, man. To Ca- talk to him. Talk wow. to him. Talk to him. Wow. It's safe to say we might have one of the, um, and the, well, scratch that. The good part about movies is they, they never die. Yes. So yeah. sometimes with music, it, it can fade away a little bit, mm-hmm. but movies are here. Yep. You know, so, but it's safe to say we have one of the, the best, uh, Short films on YouTube. Absolutely, four million views. That's yeah. a lot of views, you know. Yeah. Um, and the, to know that it, it was done like straight off the humble, straight off of like two, three people coming together and saying like, "I we, we ain't got no money. We ain't got all this. We, all we got is resource, a few resources. Let's figure it out." And you know, me, me, you, and E Elijah, we wrote the project, we created the project, we produced the project. I'm super grateful still to friends of mine who decided to be in the project. In fact, you know, <laughs> like without those things, we wouldn't have had anything. And it was, and that's what I love. Like when we got like people that are just hungry for like telling a story. And when you get that, you get just naturally four million people that just see it and right. be like, "I want to, I, I fuck with this." Quick background: mm-hmm. How did the movie come about? Yeah, so the movie came about because Jones. You, uh, <laughs> Jones uh, hollered at me in my DM, if I'm not mistaken, and was like, yo, bro, I'm, I'm a fan of what you got going on. Like, nice. I got an idea. Um, didn't I, know what I was doing. Didn't know what you was doing. Yeah. Uh, it was like, yo, I got an idea. Small idea. It was, and it was like not even a fully fleshed idea. Didn't even have a script. Didn't have a script, nothing. He was like, yo, I just got this idea for this project I want to do. I'm from the music inside. I'm from the music industry, but I, I got this idea. Would you help me bring it to life? And at that time, I was moving to Los Angeles, so yeah. I was like, sure, let's get it, but we got to do it in like two months, a month, because I'm about to move to LA, and you know, that'd probably be tough to get it done after that. And from that conversation, we went on to have just hella conversations, and, and we went from one small idea to then a fully fleshed idea, to a script, to casting, to a table read, to get in locations, to shoot in, all within like two months. Yeah, because I think we linked at the end of February. Yep. I didn't. I didn't know that you should have a script done before you reach out. Yeah. Like I said, not I, always. Not always. Okay. But yeah. You could but, have a, but a teaser, a, a log line. Right. Right. Yeah. I didn't. Which you, that. you didn't even have the log no, line. No. I didn't even have that. I had a title and yeah, a premise. And a premise. And I'm like, um, you know, basically, I'm like, I knew you knew. The industry side i'm like okay he can act and you know what you're doing you know how to put it together yeah so i'm like and i so truthfully like i if i was jerry jones you know you were the head coach in mm-hmm. a lot of ways because it's like you know what do we do yeah you know what i'm saying because yeah. it's like you can navigate through the industry so you help. and also not to cut you off i didn't know what to do so we learned in a, essentially together because yeah, i was like I know I got some actor friends. They all probably going to say yes because they cool with me. I knew Boogie. 
Shout out to Boogie because he was had assistant directed all the Spike projects and he was the assistant director on Miracle Boys, which was mm-hmm. one of my first projects. I knew Bless because just being around in the industry through, you know, shout out Stacey Muhammad. Like, I, so I knew people. I didn't know how to approach them or how to come at them or what to do. I was at that time writing scripts a little bit, and right. you know, so I, I think I supported you with learning how to write, like yeah. knowing the process of a script. Um, but we did all that in two months. Facts. So it was me, you, my brother Elijah Don Martin, and it was like, okay, like where do we start? Okay, we got this person. He's good. okay. Boogie can direct, and we did. You know, it's like the casting. And actually, originally, I asked you if you wanted to play Lonzo, and oh, you was yeah. like, okay, maybe. I would mm-hmm. do better at Malik. Uh, Malik, yeah. So, which was cool. So that led us to find Givey Eye. Find Givey Eye. Joseph. Yeah. Um, Brittany Chance. That was a really good friend of mine. Yeah. Then we found Andrea Rochelle. And, you know, these were all people that was, especially Givey Eye and Andrea, like, we were, they were bubbling at, yeah, especially Andrea at the time. They were both on power. On power. Give you know what I mean? Power. You know, so, like, it, thankfully, they just was like, as soon as I brought them, the, you know, I came to them, they was like, sure. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Fire. We just had to figure out the scheduling, um, but it all worked out perfectly. And, and the vibe on the set, you know, everything ended up being just like top notch. And um, it was all, you know, you, you, it was funny, like, I always remember just telling you certain things and you like, I'd be like, yeah, you know, you ain't got to pay them that much. And you being like, nah, nah, I'm going to pay them. I'm going to pay them. I'm, and I'm like, yo, that's not how the industry works. Some people will look out and do pro bono. Yeah, you yeah. had very much still like, from the a street side. mentality, the, you know, the, just the a mentality that you wish people had. Exactly. You because, I mean? because you learn a lot of times in business, sometimes free stuff can cost the most. Yeah. But then some people are passionate and yeah. they're like, no, I'm I'm here to work. Yep. You know, I'm, yep. I'm here to get it done. So it's like, um, well, we had one meet and I think we linked up at like Morton's. Yep. Morton's. And that was at like. The, Still the best lamb chop I probably ever had in my yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, it was fire Still. lamb chop, Still. Morton's macaroni. Macaroni and cheese, chef kiss. Yeah, it was fire, it was yeah. fire. So <laughs> I haven't been back since. I know, <laughs> we gotta go, we gotta go. <laughs> no, nah, but, uh, and then we did, um, that was like yeah. March, and then we shot April, three days, Friday. Yeah. Uh, no, no, pardon me, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Mm-hmm. And we shot like three 12-hour days. That's it. Knocked it out. Should have did like a little bit more B roll. A few more things we should have done. Yeah, there's a lot of we shot in a very minimal way. Very minimal. And I way. didn't. Yeah. I didn't know better. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, and then yeah. you know, as we're doing wearing so many hats, you can't keep stopping to you know to yeah. check. My brother is you know he's more analytical, which is why you know that he was an asset at the time. Um, that day, I mean, those days. Yeah. But it's like sometimes even myself, like I'm I'm all over the place anyway. Yeah. So it's yeah. like that's why I gotta have some people next to me sometimes, like to help. But absolutely. But it worked. We was all stuffed in the Airbnb. Yeah. Running running around back and forth. Um, yep. And we did uh, what the restaurant. Then the next day, and then we had the outside yeah. at the last day. But it, it was it was super dope. Good process. What was the reception that you received from the people? Oh man, people love God bless you. Like it's crazy. Like I've always managed to do projects, and I'm like, I don't necessarily know the influence it's gonna have on people. And then I have people still to this day, like, yo, bro, why you? That's crazy. Your sister did you like that on that, that, yeah. that YouTube joy? And I'm like, what? You, where did you watch that? God bless you. And like, man, and that's why I just I'm grateful for my career. You know, I'm grateful to work with the people I've worked with, just because. When you don't put so much anxiety in a project, when you don't put so much, like, when you just put your heart into it, it usually shows, you know? And I've, yeah. I've been, like, blessed to be a part of just, like, just some real hard work, you know what I mean? Just work that's, like, straight from the gut that you just, that everybody is just, like, puts our brain together, whether, whether it ain't about the money, it ain't about the fame of it, it ain't about the views, you just be like, yo, let's just do this. And, and um, you know, God bless you is definitely one of those projects. Definitely. Okay. Well, I think that's a good place to stop, man. That's, <laughs> <laughs> nah, I like it. I like yeah, it. You, yeah. I mean, when you're right, you're right, man. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that's the number one movie on YouTube right now. God bless you, the movie. Yeah. yeah. But um, you know, you've had a, a, a hell of a career yeah. in the past. I think you got a lot of uh, in front of you. 
You know, yeah. we recently just seen you on something on the Lifetime Network. Yeah, shout out to the Safe Room, Boris Kojo. Boris Kojo. Nicole Ari Parker, you know. Just so, shout out to them for for that. that. That was a dope joint. I just seen you shooting, um, what was it? It was the uh, the young man from Moonlight was in it. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm, I just shot a film called Story Ave, uh, directed by my guy Aristotle. Um, we got the young, this cast is phenomenal. It's, it's Melvin Gregg. It's um, Asante Black from When They See Us, also from This Is Us. Um, this this cast is, going, is special. You know, Hassan Johnson is in it. He played Wee Bay on The Wire, played My Pops on The Wire. Um, it, it's, it's dope. It's, it's going to be a really, really dope project. Coming of age story about this young, young, young kid and the uh, young skateboarder and the Bronx and all that he, he goes through in like a, a, a summer, you know, and, and, and the, you know, that's the type of projects I like, man, projects that like you look at and you're like, I, I feel that, that's my neighborhood. I was that kid, you know, I know that kid, you know, those are projects that I really love. So I'm excited for y'all to see Story I have really soon. Um, that, that cast is just phenomenal. Is there a release date? Nah, we don't have a release date yet, but, um, it, it'll be out soon. Are you going to do a festival run? Yeah, they're doing festival runs. They're doing the whole nine. So it, it definitely look out. Yeah, I can't wait. Luis Guzman is in it as well. Oh, he's a uh, classic. Yeah, Luis Guzman. He's, been, he's one of those guys that's in everything. Everything. Yeah, yeah, everything. yeah, yeah. Everything. You you look and like he in this Netflix joint right now, The Adams Family. I'm oh, yeah, like, yeah. Right, it's about uh, the daughter, I forget her name. Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. The joint's called, it's called Wednesday on oh, Netflix. Fine. Yeah, so. You know, it's he one of those actors that's just like you put him anywhere he gonna shine. So yeah, it's it's good. It's a good a good joint. All right, but that's dope. Story Ave, man. We can't wait to see that. Yes, sir. All yes, right, sir. man. So that's that's it. We're gonna stop there. Okay. All right. Thanks, man. Salute to McCall. Shout outs to the good people down at Independent Dope, like.